So which exercises activate the rotator cuff muscles the most? We've got a brilliant piece of research to share with you today that highlights which exercises we can use to rehab specific rotator cuff muscles. If you're ready, let's dive in. So today we're exploring a systematic review from Edwards et al in which they looked at patients with no shoulder pain, so normal shoulders, and put them through different exercises using EMG studies to see which exercise activated which rotator cuff muscle the most. It came up with some fascinating results. Before we dive into that, let's look at the anatomy of the shoulder in very quick detail. So let's use this opportunity to look at the anatomy of the rotator cuff. And we have four rotator cuff muscles that we can remember with the acronym SITS, S-I-T-S. S stands for supraspinatus, I stands for infraspinatus, T stands for teres minor, and the other S stands for subscapularis. Now, if we look at their role and their position quickly, if we start with supraspinatus, we can see that it's on the uppermost superior part of the shoulder, and it's suggested that this muscle has more of a role in abduction with some assistance in external rotation. If we look at infraspinatus, it's suggested to be a pure external rotator. Teres minor is also suggested to be a pure external rotator. And if we then head round to the front, we find subscapularis with its anterior position, making it a key medial rotator of the shoulder. And these are all important when we consider the exercises that activate them. So in their research, Edwards et al. looked at 43 different exercises and tested each of the rotator cuff muscles for these exercises by comparing their MVIC, Maximal Voluntary isometric contraction. This basically means comparing how much muscle activity was generated during each exercise. So let's start with the supraspinatus and look at what exercises activated this muscle the most. So going from low activation to high activation, at 27% we have normal routine active flexion or elevation of the shoulder. Then coming in at 74% we have prone external rotation to 90 degrees of the shoulder. Then at 82% we have prone horizontal abduction to 100 degrees. And at 99% we have the push-up plus exercise, therefore demonstrating that push-up plus seemed to be the exercise that generated the most activity for supraspinatus. So next to go through some of the highlights for infraspinatus. Incredibly, an exercise we use all the time, external rotation of the shoulder with zero degrees abduction position, just 13%, very low compared to how much it's used. At 54%, we had prone external rotation with the shoulder at 90 degrees. At 64%, we had prone horizontal abduction of the shoulder at 90 degrees. And at 104%, we had the push-up plus. So seemingly this exercise really does increase the activity for supraspinatus and infraspinatus. Next, some of the highlights for teres minor. At 45%, we had prone external rotation of the shoulder at 90 degrees. With 69%, forward punches. At 109%, we have a high row exercise and at 112% resisted shoulder flexion, in this case using a TheraBand. And then finally, for subscapularis, at 65% we have internal rotation of the shoulder with the shoulder positioned at 90 degrees of abduction. With 74% we have a high row exercise. 97% with a resisted shoulder extension exercise and 99% for resisted shoulder flexion. Once again, resisted shoulder flexion also gaining high activity for subscapularis as it did for teres minor. So two exercises that really stand out for me. First, the push-up plus, which gives really high activity levels for supraspinatus and infraspinatus, and resisted shoulder flexion, which gives loads of activity for teres minor and subscapularis. This is really useful when we're planning our rehab programs for our patients. So how do we bring this into our practice? Well, ultimately, it's great to learn some of those exercises, knowing what activates the rotator cuff muscles the most. But then, of course, we need to be specific for our patients. What kind of activities do they involve themselves in? What kind of exercises do they feel comfortable and uncomfortable for them? Therefore, it allows us to use that research to plan individualization for our patients' rehab.
So guys, I really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please support us by smashing that like button and remember to subscribe to the channel for all our best updates. We have loads of resources for physiotherapists on our Instagram channel, at Clinical Physio, and on our website, clinicalphysio.com. My name's Khalid. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon, here on Clinical Physio.